there seems to be quite a common trend in people asking questions and the kind of responses that they receive. I'm talking about piano questions and questions that pianists ask, which normally refer to phrasing in a piece and a fingering technique for a particular piece of music, which is normally the reason they are asking the question is normally because the piece is above their current ability. And that's good because otherwise they cannot progress. But the point I would like to highlight is the responses, not so much the questions, because everyone has questions and that's fine. What struck me about the responses is that there was always at least one or two people who said that the pianist should no longer continue with that piece of work, that it was probably beyond their abilities. And quite often, the person who asked the question would agree. They would submit to this, this negative state of mind and they would agree with the per- They would thank everybody for saying what they should do, the ideas, the recommendations, and that perhaps the piece was actually too far advanced for them and that they were trying far too hard, and that they should try something which is more their level. And this really uh, disappointed me. What I would like to do in response to that is share a story with you. Maybe you are in one of those positions as well. You feel that you're playing a piece of music which is currently above, you perceive, it is above your current ability. But I'd like to share a little story with you. It requires a bit of fantasy thinking, but hopefully you'll understand the message of the story. That's the first part of this particular podcast. There are a group of frogs jumping through the forest, and unbeknownst to any of them, there was a deep hole in the ground. And two of the frogs leaped into the hole accidentally. And they were trying to get out of the hole and jumping and jumping. And they just couldn't get out. And all the other frogs were saying, uh, you're too deep, you can't jump out. It's not possible. Stop jumping. You must realise that you're just going to use all your energy and that you're going to die in that hole. So just stay there. And after some more time trying, they were both jumping and jumping. And one of them finally did take heed of the advice of all the others standing outside this hole and stopped jumping. And he was to die in that hole. But the other one continued jumping. And the frogs outside the hole repeatedly said, stop, stop. They were waving their little arms. Stop, stop. Just admit the situation is impossible and stay there. But this frog continued jumping and they were waving their arms. Stop jumping, stop jumping. Finally, the frog was able to jump in such a way that it jumped out and joined all the others again. And the frogs who were shouting down said, why did you keep jumping? We were telling you to to stop jumping. We were waving your arms. And the frog who escaped looked at them and was waving its arms saying, stop talking, stop talking. And this frog had to explain that it was deaf. So you see the frog interpreted the signs in a different way. It's all about the state of mind. The other frog listened to all these people and agreed with his inner voice to stay in the hole and give up and he died. But the other one, who couldn't even hear what they were saying, assumed, because his inner thinking was positive, he assumed that they were saying, come on, keep jumping, keep jumping, keep trying, keep trying. And that's why they were waving their arms. Whereas in fact they were saying the opposite, but because he was deaf he couldn't hear them. It's a very, very clever story. And I think some commentators on the various piano forms should take note of that story because there are many, many I've noticed negative people who are far too strict in the way they comment and give recommendations for people who are currently experiencing difficulties. So I'm here to say that there is at least one person in the world of piano who knows that whatever difficulty you are experiencing at the moment, it is only temporary and you will overcome it. As always in my philosophies, first thing to do when you have a problem on the piano with finger work or memorization, whatever it may be, is to leave the piano. That's always my first thing, leave it. Because what you must understand is that the fingers can only do what the mind can imagine them doing, and the fingers cannot do what the mind cannot imagine them doing. That really is the key secret to pianism. Because the brain is not in the fingers, you don't have 10 brains. It all happens in the mind, and the fingers are a reaction, a response, an external expression of what is in the mind. You'll be surprised if you actually imagine yourself playing a piece of music that you know, and you can honestly imagine it in your mind, playing it completely. You can visualize yourself playing it as if you are watching yourself as an observer. You're watching your hands as if you are somebody else. Whereas if you try to imagine yourself playing a piece of music that you cannot literally play because you don't know the first note, then you cannot imagine yourself playing it. So so your hands cannot do it as a result. So please understand that it's all in the mind and the body simply follows the mind. That's why you don't really need a piano to help you overcome your difficulties. And the best thing to do is to leave the piano, separate yourself from it, 
because your fingers are not going to give you the answers. The piano is not going to give you the answers. The answers are already in your mind. Even if it requires listening to advice from somebody else, such as this podcast, the point is that once you are alone without the piano, the answer will come to you. And that's an absolute surety. The second thing I'd like to discuss in this particular podcast is an idea which I have uh, recently come up with in my mind to answer people's questions about identity and self-expression. Now, podcast two talked about realizing that you are the moon so that you don't need to artificially paint a false reflection of the moon on the river. And this notion I I would like to take in a different direction now about not worrying about what your self-expression is. So once you've identified yourself as the moon, as I discussed in the previous podcast, now the second problem which some people have is what if people don't like my moon? What if people don't like me as a moon? What if they don't like my reflection? You could consider this part of the subject of uh, stage fright, but that will be discussed in another podcast. In this podcast, just focusing on the idea of self-expression and individuality and why you shouldn't worry about what you play. Because if you play you and everyone does that, then it's all fine because no one is comparing themselves to anybody else. Imagine a world where everyone is comparing everyone to each other. It would be impossible to identify because there isn't one, the most perfect example. So everyone is just looking at everybody else. It's like a hall of mirrors, you know? It's very, very impossible to find the source image. So I created this ideology of imagine that there are one million people who are asked to draw 10 circles as well as possible. And these are drawn by hand and they're all handed in, and all of these are inputted, they are scanned by a big computer, and what that computer is going to do is two things. The first thing it's going to do is look for any comparisons between each of the 10 circles drawn by each individual, and then see if any of the other circles which have been drawn match up to any of which have been drawn by each individual. And I don't think it's too much of an of a stretch of the imagination to assume that each of the circles drawn by each individual will not be the same. There will not be one circle which is the same. Maybe sometimes two of the circles will be similar, but it will be a very, very, very small percentage. And then to compare all of the circles drawn with every other one and to see if there are any similarities. Now, this is just a circle, don't forget. I don't think it's, again, too much of a stretch of the imagination to assume that almost none of the circles will be the same. There will always be a tiny difference in size, what part of the circle is a bit longer than anything, you know, what makes it uncircular. So that would be the first comparison that the machine would do to compare each circle with itself from one person and then compare it to all the other um, million people. And then the second thing it would do is to compare all of the circles to one perfect circle, which it has created itself through some laser technology. And it is absolutely, you know, the most almost absolutely perfect circle that could ever be created by a laser and it is created and compared to every circles which have been drawn circles by one million people so the and again you you must understand that probably none of those circles quite surely none of those circles drawn will be a perfect circle there may be some maybe a few thousand a few tens of thousands a few hundreds of thousands perhaps which are as near as possible by the human hand to be circular and they're very, very good, even if they have tiny differences which are not perceivable by the eye. But all in all, there won't be one perfect circle, and amongst all of the circles drawn by everybody, almost none of them will match. Yet, they are all circles. That is how the pianist should see himself, as a circle, as if you are drawing a circle. The point is that although you're a circle and everyone knows you as a circle, it is humanly impossible to be exactly the same as everybody else, as every other circle. It's just not possible. And you could do the same experiment for triangles, squares, anything. Hopefully, that way of thinking will relax you a little bit and make you realize that although you are a pianist, you're a little bit different to every other pianist. And that's okay. There's no reason to worry about that. So in conclusion of this brief podcast, understand that frog story. Understand that even if people tell you that something is not possible in in terms of piano playing, that you're playing a piece too advanced, you're playing in a key that you shouldn't be playing in, you're looking at chords which are beyond your ability, do not listen to those people. You have to be like the deaf frog who believed that people, just because of his inner voice, believed that people were encouraging him to jump out. And eventually he did, but he didn't do it necessarily because of them. He did it because of himself. And again, secondly, you are a circle. There could be 100 million circles, but not one of them is the same. Some of them may be more round and more perfectly circular, and others may be more oval, but you're still a circle. And it's not necessary to play anybody else. As I always say, 
play you.